A new season is among us. Maybe you're starting a new school, a new pre-professional program, perhaps it's a new company contract, or maybe you're headed back to your usual spot at the bar. Wherever you might be, a new season can be an exciting time for dancers, but it's also one that can bring on a ton of challenges, especially in regard to setting forth realistic goals and practical expectations. In today's discussion, we're going to discuss more about how you can make this your strongest season yet. Hi, I'm Rachel Fine. I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist, certified eating disorder specialist, and intuitive eating counselor here to help you and your fellow dancers build the most sustainable habits both in the studio and out. Today we are talking about how to set forth your strongest season yet. Because while this time can be super exciting, fresh starts, new teachers, new choreography, new opportunities, auditions, class placements are around the corner and it can bring on a ton of stress and anxiety for a lot of dancers. Now, if you're coming from a place of dancing pretty intensively, whether it's coming out of an intensive, maybe a summer intensive, then you might feel a bit prepared for this new season. But if you're coming from an extended holiday time away from the studio, maybe it's a layoff, then you might be feeling a little bit more stressed out, especially in regards to, and I quote, getting back into shape. Regardless, we can utilize this new time as being a time of opportunity. We'll want to evaluate studio and company expectations in order to set forth the most realistic goals that will set us up for success come audition or performance time. So when it comes to expectations and goals, I often see a lot of people confuse the two and actually use them interchangeably. But there's a difference between expectations and setting forth goals. Expectations, these are built usually based on a certain standard your teachers, your directors, choreographers, maybe even friends, even for ourselves, parents. We can all have expectations. These expectations are usually born from a standard. And this standard is what oftentimes sets the stage for a dancer in creating their goals that they want to accomplish during a set period of time. The problem with expectations, dancers, and oftentimes the struggles that we experience during these times of new seasons is that most expectations, particularly surrounding food, body, and even work ethic expectations for dancers are quite, for lack of a better phrase, skewed. When it comes to food expectations, we often see a lot of dancers with this mindset of, and I quote, I'm a dancer, I need to eat super healthy. And this is why in the work that I do as a dietitian for dancers, most often I am debunking the myths surrounding lifestyles like clean eating and other restrictive types of behaviors around food. Because oftentimes the standard or expectation set forth within the dance world is that dancers should comply by these rigid eating plans to gain success when in fact they usually land them in waters of burnout and or an injury. What about body expectations? This is another incredibly important topic. It's one that I've discussed many times on this show. Body expectations for dancers are unfortunately not only unattainable but rooted in a lot of elitism, privilege, and even racism. The idea that only one single, and I quote, ideal dancer's body exists excludes majority of dancers in this world. It also strips away the interest and diversity from dance and from a large scale perspective drives so many of the struggles like disordered eating and negative body image that most dancers experience. And let's talk about the expectations of work ethic for dancers. 
grind culture or hustle culture, that rise and grind mentality, something that I struggled with personally in the past as well, not knowing when to take time off, feeling shameful about needing to take time off from dancing or from the studio, and just this idea of really struggling to take time away from what you're doing, time to rest and recover. This is super challenging for so many dancers because of the unfortunate expectations set forth by the dance culture at large. So as you can see, unfortunately, many of these food, body, and even work ethic expectations that are set forth for dancers are not just unattainable, not just questionable, but arguably they're pretty darn harmful. So when dancers are beginning their new seasons or a new company contract, maybe it's a promotion, whatever it might be, setting forth goals for their upcoming season can be quite challenging when the expectations are unfortunately just not attainable, practical, or realistic. So the first and foremost, as you're starting your new season, you need to reevaluate the expectations set forth. A lot of the question here also comes down to how is the environment of your studio or company? You know, are they promoting sustainable careers for dancers, sustainable habits, or is the company or studio culture quite toxic? This is something to consider. I know it's not always accessible for dancers to change where they're at, especially for my professional dancers. If this is your primary source of income, you might not have that luxury to change the dance company that you are about to start dancing with, right? In that instance, we do have to be extra mindful, extra alert about the potential for triggering content, triggering experiences to make their way into our behaviors. So what's super important is that we work on building our own shield of armor towards what could be very triggering. This is a lot of the work that I do within my program, The Healthy Dancer. It's a monthly membership for dancers and can be super supportive if a dancer is unfortunately stuck in a bit of a toxic dance environment. Of course, if that environment can be changed, uprooted, lifted, that would be your best bet. But I understand that might not necessarily be accessible to all dancers. So we need to, of course, focus on working on our own resilience in addition to continuing to shift the company culture at large, encouraging that they have nutrition workshops held by licensed professionals, dietitians, encouraging that they support the mental health of dancers, providing resources, enough days off, enough recovery time for their dancers. All of this, of course, is incredibly important when we are thinking about what are the expectations within our own studios and dance companies, and how is that gonna impact the goals that I'm setting forth for my own dance success in this new season. When it comes to a lot of expectations, especially today, is the impact on social media and what a lot of dancers experience, especially in regards to their dancing, but also in regards to their food choices and even those body ideals. These expectations are becoming so skewed and social media, unfortunately, doesn't help that. From the nutrition perspective of things, I see this a lot even with topics like, and I quote, food freedom or intuitive eating. Oftentimes the picture of intuitive eating or these non-diet lifestyles comes off very glamorous on Instagram. This is more lately, by the way, I would say in the last maybe three to five years where we're seeing this major uptick in uh, the overall rejection of diet culture, which is awesome by the way. But when we do have this major consumer rejection of an entire subset culture like diet culture, we also have diet culture in of itself catching onto this and wanting to bank off of the very lifestyles that we anti-diet dietitians are encouraging and teaching our clients and that includes intuitive eating. So what I'm getting at is sometimes social media will make these lifestyles like intuitive eating look like it happens overnight. You see all of these gorgeous pictures of all of this food and it becomes like this idea that we are able to eat what we want when we want without any thought put into it. And I often tell dancers that the proactive approach to fueling their bodies can very much feel anything but intuitive. And actually 
getting to this place of providing our bodies with reliable baseline nourishment every day is such a journey for so many dancers. It is not something that happens overnight. It might not even happen over the course of a month, two months, maybe not even a year. I work with dancers for years along this journey. And it is, as I say, building a working relationship with your food choices and with your body. So what I want you to understand is that unfortunately what we see on social media isn't always the best depiction even when it comes to building these more supportive habits around our food choices. And all of this really does need to be considered when we are setting forth goals for ourselves. So on that same topic of food and intuitive eating, maybe a goal for you would be to keep a pint of ice cream at home without having to worry that once you start, you're not going to stop and to be able to trust yourself that you can enjoy that ice cream at any time, especially when you want it, when you have a liking or a taste preference or a craving for it, and you can enjoy that ice cream. And then once you are feeling satisfied, fulfilled, filled, you can also put that ice cream away and know that you can enjoy it again tomorrow, the next day, the next day, and so on. So building that trust, that could be your goal. But if that goal is getting large and lofty and you are expecting yourself to do this with all of those indulgent foods within the first week of attempting to relinquish control around your food rules and current maybe restrictive or end I quote clean eating lifestyle, that could be a very lofty goal that leads you to certain experiences like end I quote overeating or eating past fullness that will further perpetuate the fear that you might experience from wanting to relinquish control around those foods. I hope that makes sense. I think I just went off in a huge tangent. But what I'm trying to say is that experiences like, and I quote, overeating or eating past a point of comfortable fullness, maybe even experiences like binge eating or emotional eating, turning to food during times of emotional distress, these are all very normal experiences that happen along our journeys of building more supportive relationships with food, building more trust between us and our food choices. But if we experience this and we think, oh no, I'm doing something wrong. I can't keep these foods at home. This doesn't work for me then I want you to know that your goal was perhaps impractical, that this will actually take more time, those experiences will happen, and we need to learn how to navigate them in the most productive way possible. Now with all of this being said, not all expectations are built on faulty groundwork. In fact, there are some expectations that can totally drive a dancer's motivation and even support their performance potential. It's important to know when attainable, expectations can help us craft very manageable goals to get there. If you've gone years, more often than not, experiencing those extremes of feeling super in control around food to ultimately feeling super out of control around food, then the expectation that you'll heal your relationship with food, it might not happen as effortlessly as social media makes it out to look. Instead, we can assume that our expectation would be to first build a proactive fueling plan to better support our needs as we are learning how to fuel our bodies from a more intuitive place. So as an example, flexible meal planning might be incredibly helpful for you as you are working towards this goal of healing your relationship with food. Mindful eating is another technique or objective that can be utilized to get you to that more realistic goal of healing your relationship with food, but from a more proactive place. How about body goals? Can those coexist for dancers? I often hear a lot of dancers wanting to strive for body composition changes, whether that be losing fat mass or building muscle mass. Many dancers will want to turn to controlling their food choices as a tool to manipulate the various composition of their bodies. Well, when it comes to body goals, we need to first understand that nobody, including your teachers, your friends, coaches, nobody can tell you what your ideal body goal needs to be. And this is because genetics play a huge role in our body's weight, shape, and size. Most importantly, if we are considering body goals, we need to remember that our bodies need to find a place where it can function optimally. Having enough fuel to move throughout this world and function metabolically, physically, mentally, and emotionally. 
And this means identifying a set point weight range that can be maintained without having to rely on restrictive eating patterns, over exercising, and the overall need to micromanage either of these tools to manipulate how your body looks. Sure. We can utilize tools like gentle nutrition to shift our food choices in a way that increases our energy levels, our alertness, how we're feeling throughout the day. But if we are turning to obsessing over nutrition information to do exactly this, then it's going to land us into food obsessions and maybe even disordered eating, if not an eating disorder. So when it comes to building goals, food goals, body goals, performance goals, these need to be realistic and attainable. Goals are individual for you and there's no one size fits all approach to any of this. Whatever the expectation might be, we want to set forth realistic goals that we can then utilize manageable tools, some of which I use with dancers include food flexibility, gentle nutrition, food neutrality, body neutrality, body image resilience, all of these wonderful tools among others that I utilize with dancers in helping them to support their overall goals of improving their performance in addition to improving their relationships with their food choices and even their bodies. For those of you who want to start building goals now for your new season, a quick tip is to consider smart goals. So we don't want to make large lofty goals. We want to make smart goals. This means they are specific, they're measurable, they're attainable, relevant, and timely. As an example, you might not have any control over the success of your class placement or audition but you can control the effort put into your training so long that effort still stays within those parameters of being very sustainable and not overdoing it. So when setting forth a smart performance goal, you might want to specifically work on your extensions. How can you measure the increase in your extension? Perhaps it's solely by just looking at your life with every class. Do you feel that you are getting stronger with that extension? And what's the time frame for which you might want to accomplish this goal? Maybe it's by Nutcracker in December, or maybe it's by your summer intensives. If you're setting forth a cross training routine to help accomplish this goal, as a reminder, just make sure that it is sustainable and manageable with your already intense dancing schedule. I hope this helps to give you some insight on how to decipher between expectations and goals, how to reevaluate studio or company expectations, and then utilize those in creating more manageable and realistic goals for yourselves in this upcoming new dance season. On the blog, I've got a bunch of inspiration and manageable goals that you can utilize for your upcoming season. I encourage you to check them out. Give me a comment for any that you plan to set forth. And last, if you liked this discussion, then do me a favor, subscribe, write a review, and we will talk soon.